am Sarah Cedric, one of the directors at Fluoroquinolone Toxicity Study. Our nonprofit foundation is focused on researching the mechanisms of cellular damage associated with a popular class of antibiotics called fluoroquinolones. These drugs are the strongest antibiotics on the market and include such names as Cipro, Levaquin, Avalox, as well as their generics. They come with the strictest of black box warnings, and they were only added over the last few years by the FDA due to the sheer number of uh, reported serious adverse effects. Thanks to social media, uh, thousands of people who have experienced uh, such issues are coming together with their lack of concern, awareness, and treatment um, and support for their disabilities. In 2021, we were made aware of a doctor treating such patients out of Germany uh, who has written a book about his clinical experience dealing with fluoroquinolone damage. The FQAD term is what has been designated by the FDA as fluoroquinolone associated disability. It needs to be mentioned that um, FQAD is not defined by just having one side effect that you would find on the prescription bottle, but multiple systemic adverse effects. And that is what this book is about. Uh, this is a three-part series packed with a lot of great information, and uh, please find the Amazon book link at the end of each of, this, of these episodes. If you're on YouTube watching this, please give this video a thumbs up. If you find it valuable, I'd like to introduce Dr. Stefan Pieper. First of all, thanks for having me, Sarah, and for the invitation to, to, have, uh, to, to, to give you an overview over my work in Germany, Germany with uh, FQAD patients. And to start with, I would like to apologize for my vocabulary, vocabulary and my poor English, <laughs> which is limited, of course, but we will see how, how it goes and okay. understandable that will be uh, the interview. Well, I'm... Um, a general practitioner with my wife together, and we have a medical practice in a small town called Constance, uh, near a huge lake called Lake Constance in Thousand Germany. Um, and we do a lot of alternative medicine, like um, homeopathic medicine and acupuncture, but also nutritional medicine and auto-molecular medicine. Um, I'm trained also as an anesthetist in England, okay. um, and actually I, I would be allowed to do anesthetics in the Commonwealth region from Canada to New Zealand, but I am surely won't do that anymore because it's 30 years ago, but I did a lot of rescue medicine as well, and yeah. ICU medicine and surgery and internal medicine and even special care baby units for um, almost uh, half a year. So I'm trained in, in uh, a lot of different areas, but uh, now my, my focus and the focus in my practice is on patients with, uh, with fatigue syndromes and of course with fluoroquinolone toxicity. So it's been about six years since you saw your first fluoroquinolone antibiotic affected patients, also known as phlox here in America. I don't know if, what your term you might have in, in Germany, but um, when did you start connecting the dots that these severe side effects you were seeing were a growing problem related to these antibiotics because you've now seen about 500 affected patients? Well, more than that at the moment, it's probably oh. more than 750, oh, wow. something, th two to three patients daily, new patients. Um, th th there are a lot of patients searching for doctors treating them. And um, unfortunately, there are not many doctors around um, who um, are willing to treat them. Um, so I have got a lot to do with uh, fluoroquinolone toxicity, of mm -hmm. course. Um, and connecting the dots wasn't really so difficult, Sarah, <laughs> because um, um, I first patients I, I first patient I had was uh, a local from Constance from my hometown, and um, I knew her because she uh, she has had 
also uh, um, chronic fatigue syndrome. Mm -hmm. And she told me she was floxed. So that's the same expression in Germany. Oh, okay. Oh, wow. okay. They, call, they call them floxies. Yep. It's more or less the same situation now than it, than it, than it was in the 80s when the drug came out first, you know. Yeah. Mm. Wow, that's a lot of patients. That's pretty amazing. You know, we have a, just a handful of doctors in the United States uh, mm. trying to treat patients. But, uh, and we do have people from overseas coming here. So this yeah, will be I good know. for them to mm. know about you. Between 1997 to 2011, the number of flocks cases in the USA ranged from 2 million to over 21 million, with estimated deaths between 29,000 to over 299,000. These statistics were provided by Dr. Charles Bennett, University of South Carolina, during the Farmed Out Conference, June 12, 2015. Um, the range is rather large, as we know, because the medical community has not recognized the connections, as you say in your book, to the symptoms with a drug, and a huge quantity of those people are misdiagnosed due to that, which is super unfortunate. Um, what common diagnosis were your patients receiving prior to seeing you? If, if I don't know how many, how many have gone to multiple doctors before they then found you, or they were lucky enough to find you right away? Um, can mm -hmm. you just elaborate a little bit on that? First of all, the the um, uh, the numbers you you just said for the U.S. Um, it's um, it's comparable to to Germany, you know. So and actually, after I have written the book and I have count the the numbers for the German patients there, uh, there was. Um, a study from a, from a huge health insurance in Germany called AOK, which is the, the, the biggest health insurance company in Germany. And they did um, a completely other uh, technique to, to get the numbers, oh. but the outcome was the same really. Wow. Wow. So um, it is not uh, there. So Charles Bennett has got the, the, has got it right, and hmm. he he did this, the the uh, a good count of uh, of patients, um, and I I like to compare it with multiple sclerosis. Really, hmm. the numbers are equal, more or less equal. Really, wow. The medical costs are equal. This uh, yeah. the social problem, the, the 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 social medicine problem is equal because. Um, these are patients, uh, uh, these are young patients from the range of 20 to 40 or 20 to 50. So they are in the middle of their lives, of their working lives as mm. well. Yeah. Um, so um, the, the, the social system loses a lot of workers there. And, That's and a really also good point, yeah. It's comparable between multiple sclerosis and FQAD really. Like in the USA, in Germany, you have voiced there's a huge lack of doctor awareness about this issue and acknowledgement about these adverse drug um, reactions. I think we are both in, a, in agreement that the uh, governing of authorities around the world have been fairly reluctant to acknowledge the problems we are seeing with these antibiotics. And only in the last few years have they really started to put multiple black box warnings. I think they're called red, le red hand letter in Germany, mm -hmm, red that's hand right. letter on these mm -hmm. drugs. And the people in the community and our foundation, we really feel that it still greatly fails to encompass uh, the number and severity of these um, systemic adverse reactions thousands of people are having and um, they're just not being acknowledged. The book you wrote, was a direct outcome of this realization, I believe. And this is meant to be a guide from your experience written for other practitioners, right? Mm -hmm, that's right. But the word, the word reluctant, as you mentioned it, reluctant um, is actually an understatement uh, from my point of view, because um, the, the health authorities, they, they should have a duty to to see when there is um, a huge number of people are poisoned from a medical, from a pharmaceutical drug. Mm -hmm. And um, we know about that uh, 
um, actually from the 80s, we know about that 40 years now. And uh, so this is not, there's not only a reluctancy to do something, um, but um, I think a little bit more than that, Sora. Yeah, I was trying to be kind. <laughs> yeah. Do you, um, can you just want to briefly um, go over the outline of the segments in your book? I, well, or I can go over them, it doesn't matter. Um, because it's, it's broken down to uh, multiple categories for um, easy reading. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, um, I, I, I've tried to, 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 to get a structure in the book. Um, and there are four huge side effects, four issues, uh, mm -hmm. which are most important from my point of view um, in terms of, um, of toxicity. And um, the most important is probably the mitochondrial damage um, because it um, is uh, um, the, the energy uh, which, which uh, the cell is missing. Um, the power, so the mitochondria, the powerhouse of the cell. The, it's that the power it's plants, you know. The energy power of plants. your whole body, yeah. The, mito the mitochondria are the power plants of each cell. Mm -hmm. There are thousands of mitochondria in each cell, for example, in a brain cell or in a muscle cell. So if there is mitochondrial damage, um, then uh, the, en the energy supply of the mm -hmm. cell um, is impaired and the cell function is impaired, of course. Yeah. And, um, and that's one of the main reasons why there is a huge fatigue syndrome and chronic why fatigue. Mm -hmm. chronic fatigue. Um, and then um, the cell needs energy to repair, to repair itself. And uh, with, with, uh, with a poor energy system, it's not easy for the cell to regenerate after mm -hmm. having such a damage, right? Yeah. Well, the second uh, issue is uh, the collagen damage. The collagen, which means, okay. Mm -hmm. yeah, which means the um, uh, mostly the tendons and um, the joints are damaged, um, but also the blood vessels, like uh, there is aortic aneurysm, for example, mm -hmm. and. Uh, and there are eye and skin lesions and things like that. There's there are, there's a lot of damage going on in the and whole the body. Skin everywhere elasticity where, too. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Mm. Everywhere where collagen is, um, there is a damage, or there can be a damage. And the most known damage is the Achilles tendon rupture. Mm -hmm. uh, which is common really for orthopedic doctors as well, who um who are going to repair them with, uh, with surgery right. then afterwards. Yeah. This is uh, the second issue, the collagen damage. The third uh, issue, which is really quite severe as well, is, uh, is the neuropathic damage, uh, which means um, um, the fluoroquinolones are uh, neurotoxic drugs um, they attack the, uh, the, the nerve system, not only the peripheral nerve system, but, only, but also the, the central nervous system. And so um, there is a lot of neuropathy um, symptoms and also um, central nervous systems um, like tinnitus and vertigo, things like that. And you start getting into the nervous system, it, this leads to everything else. So it's That's just, right. a, it's like That's a domino right. effect. Yeah. Connected to that, um, there is um, something um, inside the brain. Um, there is a neurotransmitter called GABA, mm -hmm. a very important uh, neurotransmitter, with, which uh, the function is to bring down and to calm down um, the system. Yeah. And, and the GABA system is not working well um, with um, fluoroquinolone poisoning. Um, so these um, patients, they are agitated, over agitated, nervous, mm -hmm. um, they have got panic attacks, yeah. suicidal thoughts, um, um, psychotic thinking as well, and um, 
um, kind of um, psychiatric symptoms, really. So this is the, the last issue um, of the four. Yeah. And so I have uh, structured the book from these four issues. And then the second part of the book, um, um, I have tried to, to give um, 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 a diagnostic criteria to this, to this disease, to this syndrome. Mm -hmm. right? Because fluoroquinolone intoxication is not a single disease or illness. Yeah but it consists of many different aspects. So it's a syndrome-like disease and um, it is, um, is, it's really hard to, to get the grip on this, on this disease for an for a average doctor. Mm -hmm. And I have tried to give a criteria to the doctor, to the, to the GP, uh, so that he can um, try and find out, out whether there is uh, an issue of fluoroquinolone intoxication or not uh, within minutes. Wow. So this questionnaire I have done is a questionnaire of two page. It fills only two pages, mm -hmm. and the patient can do it um, while waiting, and then the doctor can have a look at it and see quite fast whether there is a problem with fluoroquinolone toxicity or not. That's, that's wonderful. We, we really need that here in this country. I mean, that's, yeah. Uh, yeah. that's great. I mean, this, is only, this is only a proposal. Sure. Uh, usually um, in the medical community, uh, there is a proposal like this one. And then other doctors say, well, we have to change this a bit or we have to change mm -hmm. another topic there. And it's a little bit like with the chronic fatigue syndrome, where uh, th there are lots of diagnostic criteria and mm. people, people meet every year or every couple of years and try to find out whether these criteria criteria are still value uh, valid or not. Right. Yeah, they're changing. <clears throat> and that's that's what I wanted to do with this with this uh, diagnostic criteria I have done. Um, but the problem is there are so uh, there are not many doctors around um, really acknowledging and reading uh, these criteria. Uh, so there's not a big discussion going on. Yeah, about. well, maybe we can change that slowly but yeah. surely. I know it's I I think the um, the communication it does seem what's well, picking up in the in the pu general public community. And I think more doctors are saying that we're not prescribing these drugs um, so much anymore, but we have a long way to go. This is a very complex um, medical condition, as you've just mentioned, which makes discussion a little difficult to simplify for maybe the general audience that's watching us today. But we will do our best to touch on some main points from each section of your book. And with that in mind, <clears throat> let's discuss maybe some of the key points about that first category, oxidative stress and mitochondria damage, um, which triggers, as your book says, the damaging mechanisms of all other adverse effects at the cellular level. So, right. so what does that kind of look like? If, you know, if I'm coming to you, what would it look like I might be experiencing at that point? Obviously, the chronic fatigue is one of them. And anything else that that's you typically see, and, and maybe what, and maybe a little bit, what is oxidative stress? Um, it's not something we learn in university, really. Wow, that's amazing so, to hear that, though. It uh, is, and I'm it sure is. it's the same here. It's I know great. here we're ten years yeah. behind. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And coenzyme Q10 is only something which you know from, from the ointment in the bathroom of, for the for skin lesions or something, mm. you know. Yeah, so, I would say most people have no idea, have never heard of CoQ10 or ubiquinol, which is a different yeah. form. But as a medical yeah. doctor, you should have known, you should have heard about that. Mm. So this is this is the, the first and, and main reason why people are not treated with this condition because mm -hmm. nobody knows about it really. Mm -hmm. I mean, it changes, it changes a bit 
at least in Germany, I think yeah. in the US as well, but not very much really. So when the mitochondria receive this damage, it's a, a very slippery slope. What, in your opinion, sort of happens next in that process? Well, I mean, the fluorocannulons, they attack the cell and then there is a huge fluid of um, free radicals in mm -hmm. the cell. And usually the cell is going to, to cope with that. Um, it's not that uh, difficult for the cell to cope with that. Mm -hmm. But if this attack um, is going on and is continuously going on, then the cell has got a problem with that. Yeah. And that's exactly the case in fluorocannulone toxicity. And, um, and then the, the cell, after a while, the cell is depleted with all these protecting systems, um, like antioxidative systems, glutathione and coenzyme Q10, vitamins, minerals. NAD is in there too, maybe? As, as well, yes. NAD. Mm -hmm. And then um, there is a, um, a vicious circle, really, that um, the, uh, the energy supply is going down more and more, and the cell is trying to repair, repair itself and produce more antioxidative protective systems, um, but it can't because there is not a lot of energy around. Mm. Um, so um, the the single cell is going to, to have, you know, kind of a fatigue syndrome in itself. Mm -hmm. And then the whole body is feeling this fatigue as well. Yeah. The cell is not able to, to, um, to maintain his normal function anymore. So the muscle cell who is, who the muscle cell is there to move the leg or move the hand, things like that. Mm -hmm. and the muscle cell is not able to function as a muscle cell, same as the brain cell is not able anymore to, to function as a brain cell and think clearly. <laughs> clearly, yeah. exactly. Um, and, and that's the problem. And the problem leads into this chronic fatigue syndrome, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. where there are, there is a cognitive um, issue um, and and there there is also um, a, a bodily tissue, a, phys a, a physic issue, because mm -hmm. these patients can't move anymore. They can't go exactly. around for more than ten minutes or something, and they they use a wheelchair and things like that. Yeah, you can't lift items that were like yeah. a cup, things that you would never think would ever happen. And also, oh. you know, it, it damages your your detox pathways is cytochrome uh, cyp450 which is yeah, yeah. that's all like an avalanche energy. yeah all of them all of these detox systems need energy as well so mm -hmm. another problem is that um these um these uh fluorocannulone molecules they they are catching um the bivalent metals like magnesium and selenium and oh, cobalt yeah. and copper and these kind of bivalent metals, they are catching them. So um, the cell is depleted of these metals, uh, mm -hmm. which are vital for all the enzyme systems in the cell. Um, and that's another thing which is really important to, um, to, to think of that um, all the minerals and the vitamin uh, levels yeah. in the cell are going down, you know? Yeah, and the magnesium is a big one. I know that for sure yeah. from yeah. personal magnesium experience. One of the biggest issues. That's right. You are right. Mm -hmm. In your book, you list a large set of diagnostic tests that you, you do in your practice. Can you mention maybe the categories of those tests, if, um, if you can, for the audience, just so they know what kind of things are you doing in your practice? And maybe they can compare it to maybe somebody that might mm -hmm. be doing them here. Mm -hmm. What kind of tests are you running? Well, for mitochondrial function, there is the bioenergetic health index, index which is a very, very good test uh -huh. to see how the, how the mitochondrial uh, is, uh, like the, uh, the mitochondria is functioning. Yeah. 
Um, and this is not only the ATP, which is important, you know, um, but lots of other topics inside the mitochondria membrane mm -hmm. are going on there. And this uh, bioenergetic health index um, is giving me a very good insight uh, mm -hmm. of the problems uh, with mitochondrial functioning. And I can see better mm -hmm. where I have to treat. Oh, that's great. Um, yeah, um, then that, only an ATP test, for example. Yeah. Is that a, are you, where are you purchasing or what lab are you using for the mitochondria test? Because I don't think that's a, a very easy thing to, to get access to here in the United States, which is right. very yeah. valuable. Yeah. Yeah. There is no access to that test uh, yeah. in the US. Uh, I was wondering about that because I have got some um, patients in the US and I was recommending this test and they mm -hmm. said, it's not, they're not able to do this test in the US. Um, there is a big lab in Germany who does it for about 150 uh, euro or, pound or dollars, mm -hmm. which is not, it, which is expensive, but not- Not that. really, not in the, the thing of everything. Yeah, it's, it's yeah. pretty good. So, um, so that's one test I usually do um, uh, in my patients mm -hmm. because uh, I want to know um, how compromised is the energetic system of the yeah. patient and where do I have to start with my therapy as well mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and of course there are a lot of other lab um, tests which I do like all this bivalent meta metals like magnesium and selenium and copper and mm -hmm. um, um, what else? Lots of them. Yeah. Um, uh, all the important vitamins like vitamin B12 and B6 and vitamin D is very, very important. The vitamin D level is very important. Um, I interrupt you. So do you find that you, you have patients that have uh, serious issues with B6? Because um, myself and other people within our community here don't seem to process that very well and we become toxic it becomes toxic levels in our body which then leads to more nerve damage problems That's which right. is not That's always right. you yeah. can't always heal that yeah b6 is is really a problem because b6 can be too low but also it can accumulate in the in accumulate in the body and not it's, detoxing yeah and and there is a, a toxic effect of b6 mm -hmm. when it is too high about over three, four, five hundred, and then it's uh, is a toxic level where uh, there can be nerve damage. Mm -hmm. and then you 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 can't be sure if the nerve damage is due to the fluoroquinolones or due to too much vitamin B six. Yeah, so B six is really really ambivalent. It's um, you you know it's sometimes is very important to give it. But on the other hand, you have to check it all the time. Exactly. Yeah. It can accumulate. And then it, mm -hmm. it, there is a, um, a danger that it is uh, that is going to be toxic afterwards then. Yeah. yeah. A lot of people in this country take B complex vitamins, which is all the Bs put into one. And I've, I've had a neurologist say that she's seen a chronic crisis of, of people coming in with nerve problems from that. And so that, and then that I also went through that too, because of that. So um, yeah, I think people who are flocks need to be very wary about what they're taking. Mm, um, mm. So, and, and then you have to have- oh. In the market, um, there are lots of um, vitamin B complexes now mm. without B6. Oh, really? Oh, that's good. Yeah, because yeah. they were hard to find for a while. So you had to take oh, everything yes. separately. But, yeah, that's but great. at the moment, yeah, there, is a, there are a couple of them. Okay. Uh, the huh. so, mm. I don't know if we have them here, but we'll, I guess we'll find out. So you, mm. you're looking for inflammation markers as well. Are you, are you testing for inflammation or is that part of the mitochondria test? or Information markers, what do you mean? Um, I think one of your tests you mentioned is for inflammation. Yes. Oh, yeah. What kind of That's test is right. that? What are you doing? And the, yeah. Well, the the so-called silent inflammation is a big problem in fluoroquinolone patients mm. because 
if if there is a a, a minimum um, uh, inflammation going on all the time in the system, mm -hmm. then the system gets really weak and tired because of this ongoing inflammation. And it's not a huge inflammation. I measure the high sensitive CRP, which every doctor can uh, can can do. And if the high sensitive CRP is just a little bit elevated, and the sedimentation rate of the erythrocytes as well is a little bit elevated, then I um, I have the suspicion that there is a silent inflammation going on, and with this silent inflammation the free radicals won't go down. There's always very, very high measurement of free radicals in silent inflammation because <clears throat> the cell is producing a lots of free radicals to, um, to defend itself, you know. Yeah, to mitigate because the damage. Free radicals are not only poisoning, but um, they have, they have uh, a function in the cell as well. Mm -hmm. So um, the body tries to to um, to have a defensive strategy against this inflammation, but is of course a frustrating oh, stra strategy. And with this strategy, um, there is a lot of um, free, rad free radicals going around in the cell and doing a lot of damage mm -hmm. um, and 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 that's a huge problem because you you can't get rid of these free radicals until you know the source of the silent inflammation so yeah unfortunately in america a lot of these tests you know are, are not obtainable through your traditional insurance regular mm -hmm. doctor and in mm -hmm. here in the united states um you have to seek out people like yourself that are in integrative medicine, maybe not always taking insurance. And yeah, it's a huge problem for people, especially if they live in smaller towns to find anybody that would even come close to knowing mm -hmm. some of this stuff. And, and, and probably like in Germany, you know, the insurance companies or the, the doctors themselves, their hands are tied to certain tests that they can do and you can you can bring them a list and they'll go no can't do they can't 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 do any of these so it's super frustrating um mm -hmm. i've been through that um and so a lot of people in, in the flox community are, are blindly trying to heal themselves taking vitamins and not really testing getting any tests done um so that's probably in your eyes is probably a scary strategy, maybe. I'm not sure that we, we're just, you know, we're taking the magnesium, we're taking the iron, and we can order certain uh, tests here online for at home use. But um, I think most people would be, it's very overwhelming trying to figure out what to do, of course, as, as we all know. So, what are your mm -hmm. thoughts on that? Of people just trying certain things randomly, it's probably not very effective, huh? <laughs> Well, it depends. I mean, it's not very effective sometimes, but uh, you can't do a lot of harm on the other side, you know. Yeah. So um, in spite of B6, we have talked about that. Um, there is, um, it's very rare to have a toxic level of vitamins or minerals um, because the body is able to get rid of too much vitamins and too much mm -hmm. minerals. Like if you, uh, for example, magnesium is a very good example. If you if you um, if you take too much of magnesium, there will be at one point diarrhea, and the body is not doesn't want to absorb more than that. Yeah, so you're, your this limit. Is, this this is a limit, and then you know, okay, more than uh, I mean eight hundred milligrams oh, yeah. <laughs> a day. I, I can't do that. Yeah. Um, so you, you you can learn. You know, mm -hmm. um, another very um, important uh, issue is vitamin D. Mm -hmm. Vitamin D is usually too low, and I want the vitamin D for the immune system, uh, for for the immune functioning. Mm -hmm. I want it high in the normal range and the in the highest level of the normal range. Mm -hmm. So um, to um, to to do that, you have to do um, 
uh, a blood test from time to time. Mm -hmm. But yeah. once you know, once you know your individual dosage of vitamin D, which usually is about around 5,000 5, to 7,000, 1,500 units a day, uh, once you know your dosage, um, you can stick by this dosage and you don't have to do the test anymore mm. maybe once a year or, or, yeah. or so but um, if you have got your individual dosage then it should be okay to to take the vitamin d at that level mm. right and just so so it's the d3 with k2 yeah you should absorption. always you should yeah. always combine it with k2 yeah. to prevent side effects like uh, kidney stones or calcification of blood vessels, things like that. Oh, I didn't know D, uh, vitamin D could do that. Okay, that's interesting. Vitamin D can do that. Huh. It's very, very rare. Um, I give vitamin D since 20 years in high dosages, and I have never had that problem with patients, mm -hmm. but only because I, I do tests yeah. while I'm treating with vitamin D, you yeah. know. So you have to do uh, this, these tests um, while you are finding the individual dosage you, you sure. need. And for example, with coenzyme Q10, you can't do anything wrong. You can do 100 milligrams, you can ah. do 200, 400, 500, yeah. 600. There is no toxic level, you know. Mm -hmm. You can spend a lot of money on that. Yeah, um, it's not cheap. It's probably too much. And, and there is, of course, um, an, an upper level where the Q10 doesn't work any better. Yeah. You know exactly. what I mean? Yeah, yeah, that's a hard one to gauge if you're not testing, isn't yeah, it? But, yeah, but but you won't, uh, well, it's not, a, there's not a toxic range really. Yeah. You know, yeah. I have had patients um, who took Q10 before coming to me and I measured the Q10 level and it was 10 to 100 folds uh, above the normal range. Wow. And, you know, it isn't toxic, huh. but okay. this guy has spent a lot of money on Q10. Yeah, uh, it's, it's really, and, especially the ubiquinol version, yeah. which is supposed to be more absorbable. Is that correct? Well, I'm not sure about that, Sarah, yeah. because right. uh, this is a lot of money making going around with Q10. Mm -hmm. Q10 mm. is a very, very simple molecule. Mm. Uh, and this is a very clever molecule as well. Very smart, little molecule which can ex which exists in the reduced and in the oxidated state and if you think it's better to take the reduced state state um and and you uh, spend a lot of money on that you have to know that this molecule will switch from reduced to oxidized a couple of times mm. after swallowing the capsule uh, until it is in the cell okay. you know so i don't think it makes any difference really um, at all because oh, i spent a bit of money <laughs> yeah and you can you, yeah you can spend a lot of money and yeah. then but you don't have to really do you, do you think do your patients feel a difference when they're taking the q10 i i i've had my hard time gauging that for myself um, are, are they feeling it just what more energy or just a little bit better or yeah. what kind of what should one be feeling? Q10, Q10 is a very, very smart um, remedy or, or uh, a very smart medication. You know, one one function is um, that it um, catches the free radicals. Mm -hmm. So it's um, it's an antioxidative system. Um, which is very, very important. And for that, you can really take um, for a shorter period um, uh, a high dosage of Q10 if you mm -hmm. need. On the other hand, Q10 is very important for the mitochondrial function and for the energy supply inside mm -hmm. the mitochondria membrane. So um, it's a kind of a taxi which... Um, which brings the electron from one place to another. So without Q10, there is no energy in the cell. Mm. So there are two different functions of Q10 in the cells, and both are very, very important. So um, Q10 is one of my standard 
um, uh, is, is in my standard Treatment. base yeah. protocol, you know, oh. it's very important. And even if I have patients which are a lot better or which are feeling well again and, and fit again, I tell them, please stay on Q10. Mm. You, can, you can leave magnesium and you can leave the B vitamins and things like that, but stay on Q10, mm. stay on vitamin D and stay on your nutritional uh, uh, rules you have. Part two of this three-part interview series continues via the linked video. To contact Dr. Pieper and our foundation, see the direct links in the description below. Please like this video, subscribe to our channel, and follow us on our Facebook group where we post weekly science-based articles related to fluoroquinolone antibiotics. Leave us a comment with any questions you might have, and thanks for watching.